Good afternoon, I'm Carolyn Rice, School Board Chair. The administrative, informal, and workshop session of this meeting of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia is hereby convened at 4.02 p.m. on this 21st day of December 2021. Pursuant to the Virginia State Health Commissioner's Order of Public Health Emergency, statewide requirement to wear masks in K-12 schools issued August 12th, and Virginia Acts of Assembly Number 1303, Chapter 456, and the CDC's guidance for K-12 schools, and School Board's reopening plan adopted August 10th of this year, uh, it's determined physical distancing will be used in chambers as a health mitigation strategy. There's designated public speaking seating during this meeting. And members as all, of the public, as always, will are able to observe the meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. It's this board's protocol to break at 5.30 to prepare for the formal session school board meeting to begin at 6 p.m. At 5.30, we'll conclude unless the board votes to continue until 5.45, uh, but no work will continue beyond that point to allow the board and administration to prepare for the formal session of the meeting at 6. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. President Chambers is Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Felton, Ms. Riggs, and presently on Zoom is Ms. Manning. Uh, thank you, and, and Ms. Manning is uh, participating electronically for health reasons today. And it's my understanding Mrs. Weems will be joining via Zoom and also my understanding that Mrs. Owens will be joining us in person very shortly. Okay. So that brings us to administrative matters and reports. Is there any, anything for any of you all to share? All right, and we have as, as a formal item here, uh, leadership interest, it's typical for with this board uh, each December uh, for members who may be so interested in uh, the school board leadership position of chair or vice chair to so state their interest at this meeting. It's not necessary that you do so, but, uh, and uh, this it's not the uh, time or, we just ask that uh, members refrain from any comment or opinions. That's not what the point of this is. And I think most of you have been through this already. So I think we all understand the process. So uh, with that, is there anybody who would like to, uh, to speak up? Per perhaps it's my place to start first as, as the sitting chair, uh, just to, uh, to thank you all for the trust placed in me this year and to say it's been a challenging year is an understatement. Uh, you know, we've all weathered a lot together I, every effort's been made to provide the steady leadership called for in these times. Uh, I'm always, I know I haven't always risen to the occasion, but I've really tried my best to, to be inclusive, to be respectful, not just from this dais, but in my replies to constituents. And there have been, we know, <laughs> no shortage of emails all year. And uh, I, I continue to support the work of our committees. I think that's just so key to, to this, this position. Uh, and uh, I will, I'm happy to reach out uh, between now and January for discussions with uh, any or all of you. So I'll conclude there. To make, to make it official, I am willing to, uh, to, to, continue, to continue in this role if you see fit to have me continue. And I am as well, and I'll leave it there. Anyone else at this time before we move ahead? All right then, number two is our schedule of meetings. Uh, and Mrs. Our, our clerk has provided for you all, if you would care to pull out 
should be at the top of your packet. This, a draft of the schedule of school board meetings uh, affirming from January to June what's already been approved with, and, and uh, with a few uh, either adjustments or caveats and, and then moving forward ahead through July 2022 through 2023. So this is an initial look we realize. Uh, we'll allow some time now for any immediate questions or, or comments. Uh, it, this will be uh, on the formal agenda for the, the first meeting in January, the organization meeting, uh, where we'll, we will be approving the schedule. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Manning has her hand raised. Yes, Mrs. Manning. Thank you. So I don't have a copy of that. Um, it wasn't in our agenda packet, and so I would appreciate it if things are going to be put on the agenda that they are actually in our agenda packet to review so that we're prepared to discuss it um, at the meeting. Um, one item that I would like to ask to be placed on the um, agenda in the near future, um, maybe in the next month or so, is to get a staffing update, if we could. I don't know if it's already on there or not, since I wasn't provided the information. Okay. And, and and just to clarify, Mrs. Manning, yes, these are the actual meeting dates for the next 18 months. Uh, but that that hold that thought because we do have, I believe, also we're going to get to our uh, maybe not quarterly. Thank you. I thought okay. <laughs> the quarterly. Okay, and and, and yeah, just fast yeah. forward that to the next uh, comment section. Yeah. And, and and I, I can just, just share, share for my, my based my knowledge is that this this uh, this draft of dates was just finalized today because we uh, we were still working on a one one of them was presented to me as a question so that much I can say but we will certainly get you a, an electronic copy and there's plenty of time between now and Jan January 11th uh, for you and others to. Uh, ask questions and offer feedback. So thank you. Uh, I guess it's it, it's worth pointing out that as always, we have our weekly meetings in February with budget season. And, and right now we have actually notated February 15th uh, as to, to clarify well in advance that that will be the public hearing on the budget and that, you know, and it's also a special meeting for more. It'll be the second time we get together since the presentation. So the, the, the superintendent estimate of needs February 1st, this is the standard timeline. And we have regular school board meetings, the second and fourth Tuesday, the eighth and the 22nd, which of course will have a budget component. And in between February 15th is the, is the other additional meeting in February. So anything in red or special meetings. And, and so there's that. Uh, we have June 7th, the superintendent evaluation was pointed out previously to us. Make a note of June 3rd, and, the, and once we approve two, we'll be sure it's well communicated to the public, but that, that is a Monday to accommodate the graduation schedule. And, and again, that, that there is history to that, but that's where that landed with that June 13th. Um, anything staff wants to add with this? Like I, so like I said, take a closer look at it. Um, and. There's plenty of time before the final draft is posted in January to comment or ask questions. So now that brings us to the forecast for January, February, March. Okay. Um, so this is uh, for for all of you, as, as you know, the uh, third quarter forecast this is where we have an opportunity to talk about what's on the docket for workshops, information, and action. Um, heard Mrs. Manning's um, uh, request for a staffing update. You'll notice uh, that's on January 11th, an annual recruitment, staffing, retention, and compensation update. Um, and so we are we ready to go uh, for that. You'll also notice um, an information 
section on that first date for January 11th on high school scheduling for 2022-23. So that's a reprise of the um, flexible scheduling conversation. As you go on to January 25th, um, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll mention for the 11th, that's your organizational meeting. That is the only um, workshop item that we have on there. As a, as a result of that, we're actually going to strike the COVID update unless it ends up being needed because it, your organizational meeting is going to take precedent. We also, um, on the 25th, We'll offer a conversation about middle school scheduling for 2022-23 that has both staffing and budget implications, and so we'll want to get some feedback from the board, and that's why that's in a workshop setting. On, uh, as noted uh, by the chair a minute ago around the schedule of meetings, there's a special meeting called for the 1st of February. That'd be the presentation of the estimate of needs and the capital improvement uh, program followed on the um, February the 8th um, with a uh, first budget and CIP workshop. Um, what's not noted on the um, schedule of school board meetings, um, or because it's not listed um, as a special meeting because it's, it's a regular meeting, and you only have really listed under special meetings what the purpose of those meetings is, but there will also be a public hearing on February the 8th. So there'll be a presentation of the estimate of needs on the 1st. There will then be a public budget hearing on the 8th. And then, as noted earlier, there'll be a second budget workshop and public hearing on the 15th, which is a special called meeting for that purpose. Then on February 22nd, as you noted, there will be um, another budget workshop. We'll also provide a Compass to 2025 mid-year update, and we'll look forward to bringing you a conversation about Project Search, which is an uh, innovative partnership between Virginia Beach City Public Schools and, and uh, the Navy. We will have another special meeting, as was noted earlier, on March the 1st. That is where we anticipate the board would need to adopt the school board budget so that we can transmit that in time to city council for them to take appropriate action after deliberation. On March the 8th, um, at the moment we have an update on work-based learning initiatives and our work around being uh, future ready. And on the 22nd, we anticipate a general assembly session legislative review and an update to the board on any progress being made um, on the development of an equity plan. So that is uh, that is the quarterly forecast. There are some uh, there is some space available in there, and of course, as you can see in format, it, as always, as it goes across, there's opportunity for information items to be added, and there's action items already anticipated. Uh, and then there's uh, always opportunity for, um, and space left in case the board um, has other topics that they would like to see added during the third quarter. And as a reminder, this is a living document and does change from time to time based on agenda planning needs. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Mrs. Hughes. Yeah, looking at these together, I do recall some discussion about either the 11th or the 25th or both of them starting earlier. I just wanted to get that on my calendar and just clarify that. I believe you're referring to January 25th for the superintendent mid-year evaluation. You're correct, and that's a 3 o'clock start time. Thank you. A close session make sure for I that. that down. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Spence, uh, so going back to January 11th, because it was noted last night that there would be an update. We were talking about two dates for the next, for these subsequent COVID discussions and the 11th and the 24th were mentioned. So is, can consideration be given to make, uh, putting on information the COVID update to take it out, to avoid the organization meeting? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And, and my second question is, is it 
the intent to have now we we see on this quarterly forecast two different dates listed for the public hearing so if staff could qual, qual, uh, clarify you're for gonna us. have two public hearings so that uh, so our intention would be that you would have two public hearings and that's not out of line with what we've done in the past but you would have a public hearing in the two meetings following the presentation of the estimate of needs and that would give you two opportunities to hear from the public as you're having conversations about uh, the estimate of needs the first one would be uh, as was noted on February the 8th and then the second one would be on February the 15th and then you would have your final uh, conversation on February the 22nd um, as board around the budget with the understanding and anticipation that you would get to um, your March 1st special meeting and uh, prepared to adopt the budget and I certainly don't object, but to, uh, my, my understanding is that we, the two meetings in the past, one was December and one was in February. And so if there's been a conscious decision to have them, two of them, and one of them would be incorporated with a regular meeting, um, th that's fine. I just wanted to that's be sure we're, that we're all on the same page. Well, that's what we're recommending. If you have, mm -hmm. if the board has different direction, you just need to let us know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Anderson. So um, normally at an organizational meeting, we don't have a workshop, but I do see that there are some workshop, I workshop items on the 11th that we need to need to be addressed. So do we plan to do workshop directly after the formal meeting or are we planning to convene early for the formal meeting? And then, I mean, how are we going to handle that? So the organizational function itself typically just begins, I want to say, I don't know, 30 minutes earlier. I'd have to go back and look. I don't have the record in front of me. But it doesn't, it's not, uh, I don't think we typically dramatically alter the start time of your formal meeting. We just in the past have not necessarily had a workshop prior to the formal meeting on an organizational meeting date. The annual recruitment, staffing, and retention update is a little late this year because we wanted to do, we, we actually had it scheduled and ready. Um, but we wanted to do that health care um, update. And, um, and then we wanted to talk to the PPMC about some of the staffing issues. And so this will come forward, and we think it's really important, and it's a substantive presentation. And so we'd request the opportunity to have a workshop on the 11th to talk about it. I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just trying to figure out how logistically we're going to do that so you, uh, without a chair elected. Will you be presiding over the workshop, Dr. Smith? Yeah, I think, think we amended the bylaws to allow the, the prior chair to stay on until okay. a new chair is elected so that you can get things like agenda and contracts and things signed. So we amended the bylaw to allow for that. Because I think okay. that came up last year as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. But thank, thank, but thank you for raising the issue because with agenda planning, we'll, we'll be cognizant of that when we determine the the time, I mean, we're meeting for agenda planning today so that we we keep that in mind yeah. when we'd establish the times. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else right now? Okay. And now that brings us to our building utilization committee update. And we have both Mr. Arnold and Ms. In Ms. Melissa Ingram, our demographer, who now faces us from the podium. Welcome. Good afternoon. I now have my I now have my mic turned on. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Ingram. I'm the school division demographer, um, and I'm here to discuss the building utilization committee and the annual review. Um, conducted for school year 21-22. The Building Utilization Committee met this year on December 9th, 2021 um, with many of the members here today. Laura Hughes, School Board at Large, is the BUC Chair. Ms. Carolyn Weems, School Board District 4 with Bayside. Ms. Jessica Owen, School Board District 3 with Rose Hall or our School Board members. Jack Freeman, Chief Operations Officer for BBCPS, and Dr. Eugene Saltner, Chief Schools Officer for BBCPS, are our school staff. And Kara Campbell, President of the Virginia Beach Council of PTAs, and Joan Davis, Treasurer of Virginia Beach Council of Civic Organizations, are our community staff, uh, committee members. Um, 
The, the BUC is put forth by policy 5-14, which it requires an annual review of enrollment trends, as well as any recommendations for redistricting from this committee. Uh, it is, it's important to note that this year um, at our annual meeting, we did not recommend any redistricting for this year. However, we did review the important factors set forth by policy to consider for any uh, rezoning. And I'll just go over them very quickly from the pol policy here. Um, optimal utilization of space, the desire to keep areas commonly known as subdivisions or neighborhoods together, the need to develop long-term solutions that support limiting redistricting of individual students to one time at each level, construction considerations, new subdivisions or scheduled school renovations, the desire to reduce or eliminate the number of middle schools and high schools with divided feeder patterns, if at all possible, transportation considerations are also taken into account, including non-transportation zones, hazards, and redirection of the number of students riding buses, the costs associated with various options considered, the impact of enrollment changes upon course offerings, equipment needs, or building modifications, and one of the most important one is the desire to redistrict as few schools and students as possible in order to allow the community to have a consistent um, school enrollment. Okay, and so, Excuse me. Okay, and our next slide here is showing a map of the density of students in the city of Virginia Beach. Um, this is the lighter yellow areas, as you can see this is our city um, outline here, the lighter, ye lighter yellow areas show less density of students um, per square mile. You can see these are areas which are in the southern end of the city which have lower infrastructure available um, on, in areas near bases or natural water features. Our dark, darker blue areas are areas with the highest concentration of students' residences there. This is in the um, southwest area of the city as well as the center of the city. The committee looked at additional trends that impact the, the uh, density of students here as we see them. These trends include new housing, shared housing, and homeless populations, which have a direct impact on the density of students and where they might attend school. Other important factors to consider as well are the demographics of our area. Household size, for example, has been decreasing for us in Virginia Beach. We used to be at a 2.7 household size. We're now at a 2.5, roughly 20 years after the 2000 census. Affordability is another factor for our area with our um, cost per square foot at about $165 per square foot, which is about $20 more than the regional average of square foot cost. Um, and considering rent and other things like that. Another consideration is also our demographics and the fact that Virginia Beach is a place where some military that have come through have now will now retire here. So you see in more of an aging population in our area compared to the rest of the area in, in um, Hampton Roofs. Okay, so looking at this live, this is a table here of live birth data. This is pretty much the beginning of how we look at enrollment trends and projections in Virginia Beach. Um, interesting to note, we're gonna look at a graph in just a little bit showing our highest um, peak, um, School year is 1997 to 98. This chart here starts with the birth year, 1992, where we see students born five years before they're entering kindergarten. And this is also the peak of live births in Virginia Beach at 7,687 students born that reside in Virginia Beach for that year. You can see the column in the middle there shows whether or not this number has increased or decreased from the year before. Most of the trend from that 1992 peak um, is showing decline in live births until we get to our current school year 21-22 where we're at 5,918 children were born in the year 2016 where our kindergartners are coming from this year. You can see in the next four years we, we continue to have declining live births 
until we get to the, the most recently available data is 2019, and we had 5,458 children born that year, which is a total decline from our peak of 2,229 children born per year that reside in Virginia Beach. So it's important data to understand as we look at our next table here, which is our student membership. So looking at our student membership here, um, you can see our most recent historical trends on the left. The table is broken up into elementary, middle, high school, and then division-wide totals. On the very right-hand side under the green bar is our current uh, school membership. You can see our, our student membership this year for K-12 is 63,698 students. We did have a decline of 138 students which was actually very promising for our um, coming back from the pandemic, particularly when you compare it to the year before, we saw an unprecedented decline of 2,980 students um, the, year at, the year that the pandemic was for the whole school year, with children entering after that March 2019, we had the start of it, and then September 20, 20, uh, March 2020, and then September 2020, we had students come back with a little bit of a loss. <clears throat> Our elementary schools, we have 28,335 students. Middle schools, 14,956. And high schools, 20,407 students. One of the um, items we're going to discuss is the implementation of full day kindergarten. And just as with live births, if you look at the kindergarten grade level from the left of the chart to the right, you can see that in 2016-17, when we were still implementing our full-day kindergarten, we only had roughly 4,431 kindergartners. If you keep continuing to the right um, along the data, you can see until 2019-20, we were almost, we were getting to the 5,000 range per grade level for our kindergartners there. And unfortunately, then the pandemic hit in 2021 where we had a decline of kindergartners, we had 4,077 kindergartners come in. We were um, very hopeful when we saw the numbers come in this year for first grade. If you look at the red bars there, you can see our kindergartners coming in this year again, we were happy we had an increase of roughly 600, 4,592 kindergartners. But what we do when we, when we look at membership and we look at membership projections, we follow the student cohort. So, that student grade level as they continue through the school division. So in 2021, those 4,077 kindergartners, we had 600 additional kinderg uh, kindergartners show up in first grade. So from that same student cohort, that's very promising that we're coming, we're seeing a return of students from the pandemic coming into our Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Um, you can see that um, uh, in total elementary as well, we did not have a decline this year. We had an increase of 220, 20, 222 students, which is very important for the work that we do as we follow those student cohorts through the grade levels. It's important to get, get them in early. Looking at this pattern again for fifth grade or rising fifth graders last year to sixth graders this year, we had a much larger retention rate and growth of our, um, of our sixth grade level there, where we, in the past, have lost more in the sixth grade there. We, we were almost flat, so that was also very promising. And in, from eighth to ninth grade, we had almost a 500 student increase coming into the school division in their high school years with 5,497 ninth graders coming into the school division. Okay, so this is a, so we just looked at our K to 12 enrollment, which is very important for budget purposes. However, the building utilization committee is charged with looking at everyone who utilizes the building. So it's important to understand that in addition to the 63,698 K to 12 students, we have 1,603 students this year that are served in other grade levels and programs, including ECSC, which is our half-day preschool program, pre-K VPI, which is our four-year-old preschool program, and then CSEP programs throughout, the, throughout all grade levels. 
So you can see where, or for our building utilization purposes, we're looking at a total um, enrollment of 65,301 students. I'm gonna show you a graph in a little bit, and it's, I'm gonna go over some historical factors first here that are listed. One of which is um, our school closure. So in, in school year 09-10, the Building Utilization Committee did some work as a result of some of our decline and closed Plaza Elementary School. Another thing that the Building Utilization Committee has been working on, um, we have 315 portables removed division-wide in the last 20 years as well, which is very, they, they did a great job during our high growth years, able to be used efficiently and moved around. However, that is almost equated to, to losing about eight elementary schools, the, the, uh, the 315 portables. Full day kindergarten implementation, we talked about that a little bit when we looked at the data. Um, in school year 16, 17, we had only 23% of our schools utilizing full day kindergarten. Uh, school year 19, 20, we had 19, 94%. And then last year, we had all of our elementary schools offering full day kindergarten. And you could see from the data we just looked at what the response of the community was in terms of offering that program, additional students did come into the division. And then our preschool, pre-K, and CSEP programs, it's important to note that these programs um, are, are now more structured to be managed by the school division where they might have been managed through other, through other areas like the YMCA. So in 0304, uh, state reporting was required for these programs. 0708, um, early discoveries, which was the precursor to the pre-K VPI, um, started to be re reported to the state. And in 1617, um, pre-K VPI takes over that early discovery from YMCA. So those are some of the additional students and additional space needs we have in our buildings today. And then I think it's just also considering the time and the, the unprecedented pandemic to look at some of the virtual options that have been offered. So in school year 1920, when the pandemic started, um, we had 100% of the students uh, going virtual when that, in, in March, and that was statewide. In school year 2021, Virginia Beach did offer a virtual option as well as our face-to-face -face option with roughly 40% of our student population um, taking advantage of that. And this year, we, um, the virtual option was offered in Virginia Beach through Virtual Virginia, and roughly 1.54% of students um, do currently attend this school year virtually, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you, you take into consideration that that's almost 1,000 a, a students that might have gone somewhere else with all the new homeschool options that are out there, rather than stayed into their familiar VBCPS, it's an important thing to note. So we'll take a look, now this data is um, shown on a graph here. So this is both our historical membership data, which we had a snapshot of earlier, and then those historical factors that we were just talking about. So you can see in 97-98, the school division peaked at 77,600 students. For those, 10, those 12 years in between plaza closure and our peak enrollment, we had roughly a 10.4% decline over those 12 years to 69,500 students in, in grades K through 12. In the following 12 years, which is where we are now from that closure closure, we had only an 8.4% decline over those same 12 years. However, when you take the pandemic out of the data, our decline was only 3.8% um, over those, over those 10 years before the pandemic, which averages out to about a decline of 270 students per year. And comparing that with the 4.6% decline during last year and this year of the pandemic, um, which we lost 2,980 students in the first year and only 138 students this current year. For where we currently are now at 63,698 students or the, of 65,300 students utilizing our buildings with those extra programs. Okay, and these are some building utilization charts. Ooh. I'm sorry. So next on your slides are our building utilization charts. It's important to note that division-wide 
we are 8.3%, um, our membership is 8.3% of optimum capacity. Our elementary schools are 8.3% under capacity. Middle schools, 6.8% under capacity. And high schools, 6% under capacity. These are all within the plus or minus 10% utilization range, which is considered acceptable. You can see in red there, which um, many of you might be used to during the years of growth, 10% or more, we would, we would indicate a, a, a red designation on the school in terms of they might need some relief. And then um, in the yellow there, it's if, if they're under 10% under capacity. It's also important to note for these tables here, some of the committee work that's been done to make sure that we are um, informed of the space needs at each building because they do vary by program there. So if you look at the elementary school data on the very right, you see some of our Title I schools there are recognized. Title I schools require additional pullout resources. They might have lower class sizes, so there's additional space needs there. We also have shown our K to three ratio, um, which the highest would be a 25 to one, which it is at grades four and five. However, those schools who are struggling a little bit more, they might have a lower K to three ratio and then require a little bit more space due, due to the additional needs of those students. And then we also have our self-contained students shown, and those vary as well by school population, which also require additional space needs. Also listed here are those programs we spoke about, the, the preschool programs, ECSC and pre-K VPI, as well as our CSEP programs, which are not, is not just at the elementary school level, but also middle school and high school levels as well. So we, we um, and, and in line with the um, factors that go into deciding whether or not to redistrict, we often will watch schools to see um, if they will continue to increase and have a need for rezoning or continue to decline and also possibly have a, a need for rezoning in order to have our most efficient use of buildings. Um, one school to note that has some additional space is Birdneck Elementary School. They're roughly 20% under capacity. However, it's important to note that they, um, they have a 19 to one ratio in their school. And they also um, serve the ECSC and pre-K VPI population. So that additional room is able to support those additional programs. A similar school, Glenwood Elementary School, it's the same exact footprint. Um, their enrollment is much higher. Their K to three ratio is 25 to one versus Birdneck, which is much lower. And they also are able to, um, to, to, to add programs to their, their school as well, ECSC, pre-K VPI, and CSEP programs. Some of the schools that we're watching, um, you might see some five portables there. There's a couple um, at the elementary school level. Centerville and Lanstown are two of them. In the most recent years, they have been declining in population. Centerville actually lost a portable several years ago. And so we're just, rather than rezone them, we watch to see if the increase or decline will keep occurring. Point of view, um, we're also watching Point of View Elementary School. Um, they are at 8.3% of capacity, have gotten some additional portables last year. And the committee did great work in terms of when we looked at some new housing trends um, in 1920, we reserved a new housing development um, to Pembroke Elementary School, which had additional space. And in this way, we're able not to impact any existing neighborhoods or existing students that might go to point of view, but still relieve the school from those additional students that would have showed up, generated from that housing development. Excuse me. Okay, so now looking at this, um, I'm just gonna click once, thank you. Now looking at this data on some maps, we're gonna look at each grade level here. So at the elementary school level, we have 53 elementary school zones with 55 zone schools, keeping in mind that tri-campus is comprised of three schools at three different grade levels and one citywide school old donation. Um, that's 29,720 students in grades preschool to five and CSEP. And we currently have no elementary schools more than 10% over capacity. At the middle school level, we have 13 middle school zones with 14 zone schools with Bayside Middle School and Bayside Sixth. 
serving the Bayside Middle School attendance zone. We have two citywide schools, Old Donation School and Renaissance Academy at the middle school level. And we have 15,039 students in grades six through eight and CSEP with no middle schools uh, more than 10% over capacity. And at the high school level, we have 11 high school attendance zones, um, 11 zone schools of which eight, eight have academies and one have a charter school. Uh, the committee also looks at the breakdown of our academies per attendance zone as well to make sure there's parity. Uh, we have one citywide school, Renaissance Academy, two pull-out tech centers, and one pull-out environmental studies center. Uh, so for a total of 20,542 students in grades 9 to 12 in CSEP, we have no sky high schools more than 10% over capacity. Okay, so looking at this graph once again, we're going to just turn our focus over to the projection. Um, and those are our blue bars over to the right. So we're projecting slight increase of students again for the next two years as we recover the, from the pandemic and then slight decline roughly after that. Um, by the end of that, if you take a line, you should be able to get back to in 26, 27, where we were projecting in the past, roughly 64,000 students plus or minus. Um, we're hopeful in the numbers that we saw returning this year. You know, we would have not liked to not have had a decline, but again, following that student cohort um, was, was very promising data to show that we are actually, well, hopefully coming back from the pandemic much stronger and we, we're still serving our students in the best way that we can. Okay, and I'd like to see if there's any questions. I know that was a lot of data, but. Yes, and before we go to the queue, if I, I just would like to offer Mrs. Hughes as the committee chair to see if you at this moment in time have any comments to add. I do not think there is anything that I could add. Ms. Ingram is incredibly <laughs> thorough. <laughs> She's very you. good at what she does. Thank you, Ms. Yes. <laughs> Except for clicking the buttons, but yeah, I'll work on it. <laughs> All right, so we have Mrs. Melnick and then Mrs. Anderson. And Ms. Uh, Manny has her hand raised. Okay. So I think Glenwood has stayed the same since 1990 when it opened, minus the starting year when they had 25 portables outside when it was still through sixth grade. Um, gosh, I was one of 14 first grade teachers at that school, so always very full there for some reason. Um, you showed some live birth data and mm -hmm. um, the decline um, has been from 97, 98. And um, I guess that can, I mean, that's, Attributed to live births, but is there something else also? Um, a lot of the demographics reasons I mentioned as well, um, you know, unfortunately, one of the things we're finding in our area is affordability as well. So um, we look at, when we look at new housing, we look at student generation rates. With military housing having um, more than one child showing up per 10 houses, and apartments having the least number of students show up, um, per 10 houses. So we look at the type of housing development that is coming in and what families with growing families might want to buy. We see our single family um, historically has, has been just right underneath military housing. So one of the issues we have in Virginia Beach is we're kind of growing out of land a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing redevelopment of apartment units. Now those apartment units will still be generating students um, as we saw with the rezoning we did from Point of View to Pembroke. However, it's not at the same rate that we've seen with single family housing. And so, and so the other part of that is too, um, you know, families that might be looking for a more affordable, newer single family home might look at areas outside of Virginia Beach to raise their family. Um, the other reason for that too demographically is we are, you know, a community with a lot of retirees in it. Mm -hmm. um, people will sometimes move here in the beginning of their tours militarily, go, go do other tours and then come back and maybe retire here when their children are a little bit older and then might not move out again. So that house that um, that family is residing in is not generating any students after that. So those are two of the biggest pieces I think um, in our area. Thank you. 
Okay, Mrs. Anderson. So one of the things that stood out to me was the corporate lending elementary, and you didn't mention it, and yet it's at 20, almost, it's 24.9% over capacity. I'm sorry. Under, 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 under capacity. yes. Under capacity. So, um, and that's a large school. So, I mean, are there any other schools around that area that po could possibly be rezoned into corporate landing? Um, I mean, I hate to think that we have to do rezoning, but when you're underutilizing a building by 25%, I mean, almost 25%, that, that's not a real good utilization of, utilization of space. So one of the things to think about, if you look at the K to three ratio for corporate landing, it's at 20, 20 to one. So where some classrooms um, and other schools might have 25 students in a corporate landing, has the need due to their student population to have only 20 students in their K to three classrooms. That does eat up additional space. Um, so they do have those additional space needs. Um, and you can also see they also um, accommodate um, some CSEP students. CSEP does try to keep their students, you know, close to their attendance zones, but they're also looking for buildings that have the ability to um, not just have their main classroom, but also all the pull-out resources that are involved with that for special education. Okay, um, so we have to so, keep that in mind. Yes, sure. but, but I agree with you. In terms of a rezoning, what we do when we do look at that is we will go and look at the neighboring schools, just as we did with Point of View, where Point of View was over, mm -hmm. and we looked at all the neighboring, it's usually a domino effect when you rezone. Oh yeah. Yep, and so yeah. we looked, we, and even though Pembroke does have quite a bit of special ed as well, you know, we made sure that um, those students would fit in there and everything fit great. Mm -hmm. um, but you are correct, when we rezone, um, or if we are to rezone any school, you're looking at all the schools north, south, east, and west of it to see yeah. who might be able to either take students from the school you're rezoning or add students, in this case, right. to the school you're rezoning. And you're exactly right, um, you know, programs do, especially at the middle and high school level, you know, programs can be impacted if you don't have enough students for them, so. Right. So I, I didn't look real close, but it's corporate landing uh, middle school. Yeah, it is 11.2% mm -hmm. under capacity. So. The entire building has some space. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. yeah. but, okay. Yeah, you're correct. Just, yeah. I just wanted to point that out because it just, it, you know, 25% just kind of stood out to me. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, that's a lot of space. But, you know, you've made a good um, explanation as to yeah. why that space is needed and how we're utilizing it. Uh, yeah. And at the elementary school level, our student enrollment is so low that sometimes, you know, 125 student classroom might completely take it out of under capacity or, or out of over capacity. Right. So that's one of the reasons that we really watch it year after year instead of saying, oh gosh, you know, they just got an extra, you know, 20 kids this year, should we rezone them? We try to watch and see what the trend is doing. How many students are in Thanks. the hearing impaired program at Corporate Landing Elementary? I don't know that number off the top of oh, mind. We can get that information to you. Okay, Mrs. Manning, you're on. Thank you. The historic and projected enrollment piece um, over the last couple of decades, you know, not including these last couple of years, but just the last couple of decades here in Virginia Beach, uh, the decline, is that unique to Virginia Beach or are we seeing that same type of decline in public school districts across the state? That's a very good point. Um, we have been seeing that decline like I said, it's the student, uh, throughout the country actually. Um, it's the student cohort that you're following. So even at the community college level, the college level, you're starting to see that decline in demographics. You know, back in the 60s, US, we used to have 3.3 um, was your household size. Virginia Reach right now is 2.5 again, which went down from 2.7 just 20 years ago. So families just aren't having as many children and um, that, that is really what we're seeing nationwide. So that is a very good point. It's not just true to Virginia Beach. I do think, Thank you. I, I do think too though, there's also some geographical um, components to that. 
if you look across Virginia right now, you do have some school divisions that are continuing to grow. So particularly in the Northern Virginia area um, and around Richmond. And so I think you would probably find if you looked in um, a lot of the larger metropolitan areas that you're going to continue to see. We have been at least seeing growth in geographically. Um, that's been a conversation at the state level about how, you know how that's happening. And I do think, however, what will be interesting to find out is what the nature of remote work does to that, because the, the poll was that people had to move to the cities to work. And now that may or may not be as true as we move forward and whether or not then we'll see um, enrollment shifts towards more rural or suburban districts. OK, thank you for that. And Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Chair Rye. And thank you for that detail, this detailed um, report. It really enlightened a, a lot of what we are doing and are, aren't doing. But I just like ask, ask you, um, have we incorporated the complete renovation of Atlantis apartments and what that has done to our students? Because some of those students were displaced and some of them were, they were placed in uh, hotels too at that time. So is they of this? Does this report uh, reflect what is happening in Atlantis and whether or not we'll be getting those students back and are we in touch with them as well? Yeah, so um, I don't mean to speak out of turn. I was involved in some meetings with transportation. Mm -hmm. Transportation was working to accommodate those students. My understanding is a lot of the renovation work has been going. Mm -hmm. But yes, I believe those students, you know, they, they are in that student cohort for Atlantis Apartments and, and they were getting um, help from transportation in, in order to accommodate them from the moves that they had to do while the renovation was occurring. I do appreciate you touching on that transportation because that was a far cry in the community that those students were not being met with transportation nor were they receiving accommodations at that time. So it is a complete renovation of Atlantis Apartment. They're actually moving families out. Mm -hmm and placing them in hotels. And I just need to know how, we're, how we are engaging with that part of that uh, transition with those students. That I, is a large population of students in Atlantis. And Dr. Robinson is shaking his head. <laughs> so Ms. Felton, that's a really good question. And so we made a point when we met with the planning team uh, that's doing all the work at Atlantis to provide those students that were displaced mm -hmm. transportation to their home schools. Okay. Because they're doing it in phases, which has been really helpful to us because instead of looking at an entire neighborhood of, of students, we're looking at groups of students that we are then transporting to keep them in their same school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're yep. in that student cohort. So I will try to connect, especially with the civility, because that was some that was a component that was not uh, really clear with the parents of what was happening. So this is a good report at this time to let me know what we are doing and how we're interacting with that because it was, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Okay, anybody else? All right. Hope, have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So colleagues, um, I'm inclined to recommend adjourning the workshop and beginning. Mrs. Linetti, are you prepared if for us to begin the closed session? Yes, ma'am, I can do that. So we will, so, so we are concluding this workshop and I would, would, do we need to adjust yet the T, which order the TV? Are we first read down to close? You would want to read into close, then we'll shut the TV yes. down. All right, so Mrs. Melnick, would you please read the motion? Thank you. I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exemptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 Part A, paragraphs 7 and 8, as amended. A7. Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. 
Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. And A8, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter namely to discuss pending or probable litigation matters and the retention of outside legal counsel. I need a motion. Okay. A uh, motion, Mrs. Anderson, a second. Mrs. Franklin. Okay, all in favor, show a raised hand. We have nine ayes. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, we're, our, our Zooming Colleagues will join us at 6 o'clock for the formal meeting. Actually, Madam Chair, I said I move, so that mm. that should be me first, and then Mrs. Franklin second. Or Mrs. Anderson, I suppose, since she did it first. Okay? So Melnick Anderson, for the record. Mm -hmm. right, Mrs. Melnick, would you please read the certification of closed session? Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Okay, motion to approve. So moved. Mrs. So moved. Anderson and a second, Mrs. Franklin. Okay, all in favor, please show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. There we go. All right, so the certification is approved. Thank you, and we will be reconvening at 6 o'clock for the formal meeting.